Hello, so I'm going to do a little demonstration piece of this little peacock. He's from the Bayer Tapestry and in the original is actually a pair of peacocks and I've included the fat round peacock in the book so I thought I'd do this one as a companion piece to it for this little video here. I only just recently found out that there are some people who are trying to argue that that's actually a turkey which is impossible but never mind. So I've drawn my design onto here and the one I'm copying is I've actually photocopied this out of my bio tapestry book and if you ask me the home printer font photocopier is one of the greatest design tools ever invented. I photocopy my own drawings, I photocopy bits out of books because quite often you want a picture of what you're working on close to where you are and you, you want your original drawing close to where you are but you don't want to ruin them by having them battered about near your frame so just photocopying whatever you need and putting it near I actually tend to pin things to my frame just above where I'm working that's great because quite often these little medieval creatures they have their own character and you want to try and capture some of that when you're sewing them. So having the original drawing nearby as a reference is great. Now, when I do my own work and when I produce my kits, I work exclusively with naturally dyed wools because that gives you a closer colour experience to what the originals were like. And what I never, ever do is I would never, ever try to match those colours because those colours have had nearly a thousand years to fade. But I know enough about natural dyeing to be able to say what the colours would originally have been close to. Now this might have been a black, or it could be a very dark blue. It depends on how it's faded. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this lovely naturally dyed blue. This one is not a wood, this is an indigo, but it's much more of a peacocky colour, and I'm not trying to do an exact replica here. Nothing actually irritates me more than matching the thousand-year-old colours because that's not what the original would look like. This red that's in the outline, that would be a madder. So I've chosen a sort of medium madder with a nice bit of oranginess in. And you can see much how much more rich and intense that colour is. The yellow would almost certainly have been a weld, so this is a freshly dyed weld. And you can see how much more vibrant already these colours are. But because I've got a thing about blue and green, and as I said, I'm not trying to do an exact, exact replica, I'm going to add some little touches of green into my peacock. You're always working on your own version of something, so you should never be afraid to change the colours up a little bit if you want to. So those that's my colour palette. So... That one's an indigo, which actually has the same chemical dye component as wood. It just has more of it. They're both plant dyes. This one is madder, which is a root. This one is weld. And the green is done by over dyeing that with that. My greens are never perfect. They're always a little bit streaky, but I've learned to live with it. So that's my colour palette that I'm going to be using today. Now, in the book... I work this stitch two ways. I, I don't actually like the name by a stitch. It implies that the stitch was only ever used for the bio tapestry. And actually it was used for hundreds of years until it becomes part of the cruel work uh, family of stitches. So I'm going to work this one quite close to the method of the bio in that I'm going to do the stem stitch outline first and then fill in. Quite often I find it easier to do the linen couch work first and then do the stem stitch afterwards. You can do it either way. But before I do that, I'm going to vary from the original a little bit because I want to give you a demonstration of the laid and couched work without the borders going on so you can see what's going on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little demonstration of both stitches and then I'm going to film the entire project and speed it up. I might stop occasionally and talk to you, but I've just discovered how to work speeding up in iMovie, so I'm going to use it. So what I've got is I've got, uh, I think this is a size 22 cruel needle, and I've got a double thread 
of my green wool. So I'm going to vary from the pattern straight away by instead of doing this bar across his wing in yellow and in split stitch, I'm doing it in green and laid in couch work because that's an ideal little spot to demonstrate the stitch. I do like this peacock though. He has a very unusual wing. It's almost upside down. Normally the wing would stick out with the point at the top here and then curve around there and it's it's like somebody's drawn his wing on upside down which is quite amusing. I think peacocks are very contrary birds anyway. So what I've done is I've done this big long stitch over the entire area and in some of the pieces in the book that area can be like nearly 12 inches long, the, the very final penultimate I think project in the book is one of the bishops from Iceland and he has huge huge long st stretches of stitches. The Bayer Tapestry tends to use it in smaller stretches but you can see that what I've done is I've gone down and I've gone straight back up again. It's literally it's, it's one thread of the background canvas. So we're not going over the back of the stitch here. This is not satin stitch. We're not going round and round and round. If I were to turn this over, all that you would see would be a tiny little row of stab stitches at the back. There's no, no green at the back hardly at all at this point. And this makes sense in a medieval context. Any of you who've ever done any spinning will realise how difficult it is, even with a wheel rather than a drop spindle, to spin a thread fine enough to make a two-ply cruel wool. I've done it and I've been spinning since I was about 10 and it is not an easy job. So the thread itself would have been very labour intensive to make and some of the dyes, I mean especially this green which is a two-stage dye, it's got to be dyed twice, is again quite labour intensive. Now you'll see that I've actually gone sort of outside of the lines a little bit there and that's because the longer you go with your stretch of laid work the more those threads are going to spread out. So it's best to sort of go over the lines and then bring it back into the lines when you do the couching. So this is the laid work stage of it. We have laid down the long stitches and what I'm going to do is I'm going down to a single of the same thread. So this was a double thread and this is a single and all I'm doing is I'm coming out and if you want to get dead on to your drawing you can move it across a little bit with your finger and then I'm going across at roughly a right angle. There are times in the book where I show you how to do this at sort of radiating angles depending on what you're doing but this is a fairly straightforward rectangle. So what I've done is I've put one bar down and then I'm going back and that bar won't sit very well on its own so I'll do it again. One single thread over the top, not a double remember otherwise you're work will get quite lumpy. This this can actually be a relatively refined stitch and then because if this bit were wider that would start wobbling around a lot on its own as well. I'm going to couch it. Coucher of course in French is to lie down or to sit so basically what we're making do is making it lie down and sit still. If only you could do that with your pets and your children. It's much easier with needlework. Now you'll notice that I'm staggering my little couching points there. I don't want to line them up too much because they might start pushing apart the background canvas and you get a regular little series of gaps. I actually saw a piece once done by a very good needleworker and what, what she'd done, she'd basically done everything wrong. She'd used a thick tapestry wool instead of a fine cruel wool and she'd lined up her couching points so that it had pushed the background apart and you could see the canvas through it in all the different places. 
So that's now extremely stable, whereas it wasn't before. So I've got my little green bar there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over and I'm going to do a little bit of stem stitch to show you how that's done. And then I'm going to start speeding up the video. Stem stitch, I've just found this bit on the floor of my studio. It might not be as tidy in here as it ought to be. But this is one of the test patches I did for the, for the book. Um, it's a little bit dirty, it's been on the floor. Um, <laughs> but this is the correct spacing of the laden couch work. But you can see there, can you see? You can see the canvas underneath because with this one I've very carefully lined up the couching points and you can see that in several places it is actually pushing the canvas apart so this is a what not to do this one is another what not to do because this one is the bars spaced too far apart I tend to go for about four to five millimetres. I've seen people go for up to a centimetre. And the problem with that is you really reduce your stability. If I pick at this with my needle, it doesn't take much to just really pull a chunk out of that and make a right mess of it. This is much more stable at the narrower width. It also means that you can see how that is buckling as it moves. I mean, a lot of people will say, oh, well, I'm going to frame mine so it doesn't matter. And I always think that's a poor excuse for a bad job. Space your bars nicely together, four to five millimetres. Once you get more, and this is only actually seven millimetres, and you can already see that it's not behaving as well as it ought to, and it's not as stable as it ought to be. So these are two very bad examples. One is lined up too much, one is overspaced. But they both show you on the back what you should be seeing at the back, which I did think of doing camera shot, but it makes it very wobbly when I hold it by hand. You can see that to fill the space, you've got this little row of just dots around the edge. And then the back of the couching is just a series of little cross not even cross stitches just a series of little almost wonky running stitches and that's going to keep it nice and stable so all of your color all of your thread all of your hard work is on the surface of your sewing so i'm ready now to start on my stem stitch for the outline now stem stitch is quite simple and it's just a variation on common back stitch which I don't know about you but that was the first stitch I ever learnt as a child. All you do is I'm going to start off a little bit wonky here to make a nice thick line. So I'm doing my stitches are about five mil long. I'm coming back to there and I'm working along the line. So the back of this will look like backstitch. If you start to stretch it out and you have a little row of dotted stitches with gaps between them, you'll get very, very straggly stem stitch. You can also, which I sometimes find a bit easy with stem stitch, you can also do it by sort of hooking through. I find one of my problems with stem stitch on a frame is that I end up sewing through my thread at the back and getting myself in a bit of a knot. Whereas doing it this way from the surface is slightly quicker. I wouldn't say it was significantly quicker, but it does stop me from getting into a tangle. I know not everybody has that problem, but we all have our own deficiencies and find ways around them. But the aim of this is to give a lovely solid rope of stitch and remember to always go to the same side of your stitch i know there are distinctions made in modern embroidery routine is it stem stitch and outline stitch whereas one is if you go to the left and one is if you go to the right but to be honest if you turn it upside down you're just reversing it anyway and how you're going to tell the difference i just bundle it all under stem stitch I can't I can't understand the difference because I can't tell left from right anywhere <laughs> so 
So I'm just going to work my outline around my little peacock. So I've done my split stitch areas. You, you'll have noticed that for the eye and these little sort of blobby bits on top of his crest, I actually did pretty much stem uh, satin stitch. You find that throughout medieval embroidery where the stitch is too small to justify splitting it or making it into a stem stitch. They do use satin stitch over these incredibly tiny areas, but it's never much bigger than that. The face is done with a spiral of stem stitch, which I quite often do human faces in stem stitch, but uh, very rarely, sometimes animal faces, but very rarely. But this is like the original. In the original, the wing feathers are all done in stem stitch. But because I've done this bar in Laden Couchwork as a demo, I'm going to do the green bars on the wing in laden couch work as well as a sort of textural contrast so that it look more homogenous with one another. The problem with doing the stem stitch outline first is you've got to fit around it when you do your laden couch work. So you do, if you do it this way around, you do have to make sure and get right underneath there so you're not getting any gaps. So you can see I'm pushing it aside to get my stitch right under there. And I've changed the colour of this wing because I want to introduce a little bit of green into my peacock, but I've kept the rest of the colours about on where they were. So the outline, the original, is the nice madder red. Uh, 
and the foot is yellow but because I want to do a bluey green peacock I've changed the colour of his head to green instead of doing it in blue the same colour as his body I think he needs some, some of his blue now though because he is looking quite parroty there isn't he so I'm just going to finish off at the back there with my double and go down to a single to finish his wing and then once I've done his wing I'll get on with the rest of his body now there's not actually very much couching to do here at all there's going to be a couple of stitches on each piece because these are very small areas and it's not on the wing of the original. It's not that they've done the stem stitch, I think, because it's such a small area. They've decided to use it instead of laden couch work. I think it is purely a textural choice. So if you look at the Bayer Tapestry, there are much, much smaller areas than this that are still done in laden couch work. But I like these new bright colours. That's looking really pretty. And it's perfectly valid. You don't have to do an exact replica of something every time. It's perfectly valid to play with things. And I play with things all the time. You don't have to be a slave to the replica. You can still work within period practice. without being absolutely identical. So I'm going to get on with the blue laden couch work now. So there's my peacock looking a lot more like a peacock now. He's got a good bit of blue on him. And the last thing to do <clears throat> is to finish off his tail. Because, of course, peacocks have those wonderful eyes on their tails. Now, it's quite difficult to tell, actually, from the original. But I think what's happened is that there are more of these spots are like the ones on his crest and near his eye. So I'm just working over there to make a little spot. And then I'm going to take that out of the way. And use some green to go around the outside of it. Now I'm going to keep the red out of his spots on his tail because I think if I go red, green and yellow he's in danger of looking like his tail's a set of traffic lights which could be a bit unfortunate so I'm going to do a little spot 
on the end of each one and go round it with some split stitch. You could use stem, and I meant to use stem, I'll be honest, I meant to use stem. But I started using split stitch, so I'm just going to go with that, it's fine. The other thing you could do, of course, is put a couple of extra couching bars over. Just right over the tail, in green. And actually that looks kind of nice. I think I might do that to bring some more green into his tail. I'm not going for exact red one. I'm going for working with colours that I like. So I think that's quite nice. A little bit of yellow and a little bit of green. So I'm going to do that on all of his tail feathers, I think. Peacock finished. Looking considerably more chirpy and cheerful than the one in the faded colours. It's nice to bring life back when things have faded. A lot of the life comes from the colour and a thousand years of fading doesn't make for the best colour combinations. But this is what the colours would have looked like when they were fresh because these are freshly dyed threads using the same sorts of dyes as have been used for centuries. So there's my little peacock.